Hey, I'm Nick from Kinetic, and thanks for checking our new series, From the Floor. Uh, so one of our goals at Kinetic is improving the level of education in the industry. So we wanted to put out this series to highlight different brokers, to give some quick hitting tips, uh, just some best, best practices, common mistakes, and general brokerage advice. Today I've got Dustin from Elite Transit Solutions. Dustin, hey, thanks for being on. Uh, do you want to do a quick, quick intro? Yep, thank you. Appreciate you having me, Nick. Uh, Dustin Wittis, Vice President of Sales and Operations with Elite Transit Solutions, uh, headquartered in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, with three offices elsewhere in the country, Chicago, Charlotte, and Scottsdale. Uh, today is technically my two-year anniversary with the company. Um, walked into the office to a nice round of applause this morning, uh, which was nice. Um, but yeah, again, thanks for having me, Nick. That is nice. Congratulations. I didn't know. Um, so today we wanted to talk about sales meetings with prospects and we spent like 20 minutes just kind of chatting about this the other day. So I figured like, why not record it and do a little web series on it? And like as VP of sales, you get pulled into a bunch of sales meetings with prospects. I'm sure like in general, what are you looking to accomplish during a sales meeting when you're talking to a potential customer? Uh, from a business standpoint, we really just want to peel back the layers of the onion and understand their business needs and any current pain points they have and really try to address those. Um, we never want to just be another broker in their network. We want to be a true partner that actually adds value uh, through saving them money, giving them data. We have a great business intelligence team that's able to kind of pinpoint issues within their network and we can take that information to them. Um, and we wanna know, you know really what they're looking for in a partner. Is it just the lowest cost provider or what other factors they take into consideration uh, when adding new brokers? Um, and personally, I just like learning about different businesses. Uh, I think it's very fascinating how, how some people run their operations even within the same sector of an industry uh, can be very different. Yeah, I, I agree and I, like, I remember when I first started in, in the industry, the guy who was training me on sales kind of like prompted me to ask this question to people of just, hey, if you have a minute, can you tell me about your freight? And they would just open up. Like, even if you don't like your job, you'll talk for hours about your job. And it just opened up all sorts of opportunities for me. So like for you, when you're in these meetings, like what kind of questions do you ask people? Uh, so one question on a personal level, I always like to ask, um, you kind of ask uh, it's always interesting how people get into the business that they're in. Um, and from a personal standpoint, it's always fascinating to hear how people got into their role as the logistics manager, transportation manager, what have you. Um, but business-wise, um, we, we really want to understand, um, you know, tell me about your freight, what, what type of commodities they move. Um, on the surface, it looks like they may move, you know, one type of freight. But inevitably, they move a lot more. Uh, the raw materials are inbound, outbound. Um, do they do any importing? Um, you know, and, and we want to understand the value of the variety of commodities they move um, for insurance and risk purposes. Um, I think that's not something people put a lot of thought into up front. Um, we want to understand what their technological capabilities are, EDI, API, um, you know, from a scheduling standpoint, who does that, what type of facilities they're working with. Um, appointment or first come first serve, um, you know, you know, some receivers frozen, hey, we only pick receive overnight. If you don't know that going in, you're not going to price that freight accurately. Um, and, and it's going to be mispriced. You're going to have trouble accepting it and, and quite frankly, servicing it. Um, and, you know, weight of the average shipment, uh, any other specific equipment requirements they might have, I really just business specific uh, for us to be able to service their freight at the highest level. Yeah. And I feel like a lot of people like undervalue how important those questions are, you know, because even like providing a rate, if you're quoting something and you don't know the commodity, some details about the shipping and receiving hours, the value of the product, like you mentioned earlier, I mean, that can dramatically like, like impact the rate and all sorts of other things. So I'm kind of answering my next question as I'm talking to you, which I shouldn't do, but um, it can be uncomfortable asking a prospect a million questions about their business to you, what's the value of those questions? Uh, simply put, answers, right? We, we need to know. Um, it may feel like, uh, like it's bothersome to a degree, but mm -hmm. if you don't understand the pertinent information, you're going to fail and you're going to fail fast and you may lose that relationship. And you can lose business a hell of a lot faster than you actually gain it in this business. Um, and, you know, we want to 
we have a pretty vast carrier network. Uh, there, every carrier is not the best carrier for every one of our customers, right? Uh, so we want to really be thinking strategically about our carrier base and pairing the right carriers with the right shippers. Um, and I would say you want to, you need to know everything on that first call. It's if you've, you've done sales before, you know how hard it is to get people on the phone mm. and there's nothing worse than having somebody and getting excited and hanging up the phone too soon. And then all of a sudden you're like, damn it. I forgot these two questions. I really need to know this. So how hard is it going to be to get them back on the phone? Are you going to have to send an email? It's, you're going to look a lot more silly uh, having to send those follow-ups if you didn't just, you know, s slow down on that initial call and ask all of the appropriate questions. It's, you're, you might you might delay yourself two to three weeks in the onboarding process or pricing process if you don't have all those critical pieces of information. Um, and so, I, you know, that's one thing I tell our newer reps, like, if you have somebody on the phone, make sure you're ready to go and make sure you ask every mm -hmm. question. And if they're giving you information, it's not just, hey, I have a list of 10 questions, I'm getting 10 answers. If they say something that requires a follow-up question, we need to be able to think think on our feet and pivot and transition and and really follow up on the details for a specific point they made, whatever it might be. Um, getting them on the phone is very hard. Use that time wisely. Yeah. And it, it, again, it reminds me of something I was talking about like during our last conversation. One of my first customer opportunities, I get this person on the phone and like lo and behold, like she needs a rate from like point A to point B. And there I am super excited. Like I hang up the phone immediately. And I go to my manager, I'm like, hey, I need a rate from like Columbus to Detroit or whatever it is. He goes, great. What's the commodity? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> He's like, well, you're going to have to call this person back and find out the commodity. So I had to call her back. I found out the commodity. He's like, okay, when's it shipping? I'm like, another really good question. I don't know. <laughs> so I had to call this poor woman back like three times to get all the information I needed. Finally, I did yeah. it. Yeah. Um, you mentioned something about like being able to think on your feet and having the answers available. This to me kind of ties into what we talked about earlier in terms of having multiple people in a sales meeting. Um, to you, what's the value of having multiple people in a sales meeting? So first and foremost, uh, we, try to, we try to approach every official meeting kind of like this um, with a new customer, first meeting, um, with at minimum three people from our organization. Uh, and depending on the size of the opportunity, if our salespeople are qualifying um, appropriately, we may have more than that. Um, but it's always the person who initiated the call, um, their manager, um, and myself or another manager, uh, depending on availability. Um, first and foremost, I think it demonstrates a commitment and an investment in their business up front that there's multiple people attending. We've committed 30 minutes of three or four or five people's time to learn their business. Um, and it just brings different perspectives. Um, I know um, our CEO, um, he and I work very closely together. Um, our brains work in very different manners, right? And so I love um, for some of our larger customers um, when we are both able to attend the call, because while I'm listening and thinking about something, he's on a completely different page, um, ask, preparing to ask a completely different follow-up question that my mind was not even ever, never going to get to on that call. Um, so you're going to get different perspectives and follow-up questions within the call. And then afterwards, you're going to have different actionable takeaways. We have a follow-up call. Hey, how'd that go? What do we need to do? Um, people are going to say, oh, here's A. We need to be thinking about this. And someone else is already on the Z. Um, and so it, it just, I think, creates more actionable takeaways um, and, and make sure we don't miss any details on that call. Do you find that it helps having the having the different perspectives on like your business itself, like the individual like who initiated the call, like that sales rep might know their business really well, but like you might have a more like encompassing view of the business as a whole. That's actually a very valid point, Nick. So yeah, um, given that I am privileged to oversee our entire operation, um, I while I'm not an expert on every customer. I know our network a lot better. I know some of our uh, technological capabilities a lot better. And so if that salesperson doesn't know the answer, I am able to jump in and provide a, a pretty quick answer. So yeah, um, just visibility to our business. Um, you know, an individual new sales rep who's been with the company for eight weeks 
um, and is having success still isn't going to have that knowledge bank about our entire business. Yeah, like that's something you brought up last week when we were chatting that I thought was like really insightful, actually. What's kind of switching gears a little bit, like as you're capping these conversations, everyone gets objections. What are some of the more common objections that you get and how do you respond? Don't ever call me back again. Um, <laughs> no, um, so I would say some of, and this is something we talk about because we have a cheat sheet for objections um, for the new sales reps. So if they say own fleet, hey, we have our own fleet. We have a list of three or four questions that the reps can pivot to until they are comfortable, you know, without having those follow up questions with them. Yeah. Um, but own fleet, uh, our, you know, our freight's customer routed. We're not adding any new providers at this time, or they just find out don't work with brokers at all. Um, I would say those are probably the four most common we get right now. Um, and I, one thing I try to get, a, get across to people is no one wants to be sold, right? So I'll put you on the spot, Nick. When's the last time you, you went furniture shopping? When I didn't delegate it to my wife? Really good question. Probably a year ago. We picked, so, we picked out some like bathroom stuff. Right. So you, you walked into the furniture store and wh what happened? How did that, how did that first 30 seconds, first minute unfold? We probably had somebody come up to us immediately and start asking us questions about what we needed and just badger us until he like directed us to a couch. And, and what's, the, what's the typical human response when someone's like, Hey, what can I help you with today? Especially in a furniture store. I wanted him to go away immediately. Right? Or, and, and how do you do that? I always say, hey, man, I'm just looking. Mm -hmm. I, did, I certainly never walk into a furniture store to look at anything. I walk into a furniture store to buy something and probably buy something very specific. So when I say I'm just looking, it's a flat out lie to get him yeah. off my back. Right? And so we need to approach sales in this industry in the exact same way. Um, it's human nature. We don't want to be sold. So we immediately put up our wall and we're like, hey. So get away and whatever I have to say to get you away and off my back, that's what I'm going to say. Um, it's our job to convince them to want to buy our services, not be sold our services. People inherently want to buy. They don't want to be sold. Um, and I think when you start approaching objections in that manner, you're going to ask completely different questions. You're going to demonstrate empathy and compassion. Listen, man, I understand you get a hundred calls a day. Um, I'm, I'm hoping I am not just your running the mill broker that is going to under uh, over promise and under deliver. Um, so if you don't work with brokers right now, is there a reason for that? Um, have you had a, a really bad experience in the past that led you completely away from brokers? Um, I know they lie. We don't have the best reputation. Um, but one of the tools that we have is called the Elite Live. It's a customer portal. Um, you want to call our bluff on a lie? Log in and check where your freight is at any point in time. Um, it, you know, we put our money where our mouth is there. Um, and so, you know, depending on the objection, right, it's customer routed. Um, I inherently want to ask who are your customers, right? Let me, let me go there, but we can typically find that out anyway, given, given what they sell, we know who their buyers are, um, own fleet, uh, I think is an interesting one. Um, and we do, it's not the most common, but it happens enough, but what happens, um, I mean, COVID was a big deal, right? Hey, what happens when you just have a COVID outbreak and, you have 25 drivers on staff and half of them have COVID and they can't work for two weeks. Are, are oh, your yeah. customers just sitting around waiting for uh, their freight for two weeks? Do you, can you build some flexibility into your network by adding a broker or two who can handle those last minute call offs from your drivers? You can call, hey, I have something needs, needs picked up by the end of the day. Um, so really kind of demonstrating that they have a need and they need your services as opposed to just coming to that conclusion on their own. Um, and I think customer routed um, from that perspective, um, we have some customers that, you know, we, we're told like, we, we can't, or our vendor is, is routing our freight. Um, if your customers are routing it and they're not, their partners are not reliable. And it's, that load is staged, docked, ready to rock. And nobody shows up to pick it up for three days. Your valuable dock space is being clogged up. And so you have zero control and say in getting somebody in there to get that freight picked up. Um, and they might, it's like light bulb. Um, yeah, you're right. So we can put some guidelines in place. Hey, if you miss the pickup once, you miss it twice, 
we're not going to risk you missing it a third time because we need to pl we need to plan our labor and our staff. Um, and it's just, I think sometimes people come in, they do their job every day, um, and they don't think outside the box about some solution. So I think it's our job to just point them in the right direction as to where we can add value um, if they if they allow us to do so. Mm -hmm. Like that's like we're we're coming close to time here. So like that was all great advice. Like I appreciate you taking the time to talk today. We're intentionally keeping these short, so I'm I'm, I'm going to cut it off here so they're quick and digestible. But the industry is really nuanced. They're complicated subjects. There's always more to learn. Justin or Dustin, if someone wants to reach out to you, how do they do it? Um, two ways. Um, I have a work phone. I'm in a lot of meetings though, and it's usually on do not disturb. So my cell phone is by far the best way. Um, okay. I have no problem giving that out. It's 570-856-2787. Uh, it's Northeast Pennsylvania for anybody who's wondering. And my email address is my first and last name at elitetransit.com. So dustin.wittis at elitetransit.com. And you can Perfect. find us on the web at elitetransit.com. All right. Perfect, Dustin. Thanks for being on. And I'm looking forward to seeing more from you and the group at Elite Transit Solutions. Yep. Thank you, Nick. Really appreciate it.